All right. I like talking. I like having a series about uh, relationships and and individual and identity and things like that. And then we had a wedding last week in the middle of it, and it kind of seems wildly appropriate. And today we're going to be talking about about making marriage last. And you know, wed- weddings are always a lot of fun, and it's always fun to see couples get married and just the kind of that nervous energy of everyone kind of being up there together. It was really funny because so Michael and Michael and Laura got married last week and. And a year previously, I had married uh, Michael's brother, Andrew, and Lauren, right, and uh, his, his wife. And it was amazing just how much more relaxed Andrew and Lauren were at this wedding. Like, this is no big deal, bro. Why are you stressing out? I'm like, do you not remember last year? You know? <laughs> but, you know, when, when people get married, they often talk about how excited they are to spend the rest of their lives together, about being able to say, you know, not to say goodbye, you get to say goodnight at the end of the day. And, and the phrase... The, the phrase, uh, till death do us part, echoes this commitment that, the, that, the, that the, the, the couple has for each other. In fact, the longest marriage in history is Karam and Kartari Chand of Bradford, England, who until Karam's death in October of 20, 2016, at the age of 110, had been married for 90 years, 291 days. That's some serious commitment, right? Now, we, we, we want to spend some time talking today about what makes a marriage relationship work, but we know, we, we, we actually, let's be honest, we know that for, for many people, marriage doesn't always end in, in happily ever after. In, in 2022, uh, the average length of a marriage in the United States is 8.2 years, okay? People, people say things I know, like the divorce rate, I hear the divorce rate is 50%, and that half of all marriage is in a divorce, but... You know, that's not, that's not entirely true. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Uh, in fact, the divorce rate in America has actually been declining, which is, which is very good news, even while people are waiting longer to actually get married. Uh, in, in 2008, over 40% of the population had not married by their 30th birthday, which was a fourfold increase since 1980. So people are every year waiting longer and longer and longer to, to get married. Uh, but but marriage is a, marriage is a, is a difficult thing. Marriage is hard. Marriages take work. Marriage is can be a struggle sometimes because anytime you bring people together, you know the opportunity for pride and selfishness and, and and just ugly sin begins to manifest itself. And you know it was an interesting thing. Uh, my daughters we were driving we were driving down uh, the interstate and one of them looks over and sees a billboard and says you know you know who has the best marketing? Divorce lawyers. Of some of the best marketing, and I said, so I, so I, I said, you know, you're right, because there's some of their signs are funny. Here's one. Um, <laughs> so you do, you do a little search here. Uh, I like this one. This is uh, here's a here's a local one. You may have seen this one. Yeah, that one's right here on the six. That's a local. She's actually on the. They, they're actually on the internet. Uh, this is another one for you, Spanish speaking. <laughs> So just so uh, the word for spouse and the word for handcuffs are very similar in Spanish. Just FYI, uh, this one's okay. We're we're in good company here. Okay. Now I I admire this guy's marketing plan here. I like he uses PayPal. You can use you can use paying with PayPal. Uh, now, now, I, as as a, as a former furniture salesman, I can appreciate a little a little mix of retail and good advertising. Getting divorced, you'll need a good lawyer and a good mattress, because you're going to buy your own when you move out. So this this company actually partnered with a divorce lawyer to do advertising for mattresses. I was like, wow. <laughs> then of course, <laughs> you know, and whether real or not, if you need a divorce lawyer. All right. Look, (laughs) marriages are not perfect. Why? Because people aren't perfect. Okay? Let's understand that right off the bat. Marriages aren't perfect because people aren't perfect. I I got to speak to somebody a couple days ago who had who'd gotten married late last year and and we're I said, How is it going? He says, It's it's good. It's tough. You know, we're moving in, we've moved in together and we're figuring life out and you're all up in each other's space. I'm like, yeah. It's different, isn't it? When you can't kick them out the end of the night and say, "Go home, I'm tired of you," because you're in the same you're in the same you're in the same place now. And but here's the thing: marriages aren't perfect because people aren't perfect. But but marriages can be great 
Marriages are great when you put the work into them. They can be great because we serve a great God who's given us his spirit, who's given us every tool necessary to keep marriages alive, to help them thrive. And they can be great because we can choose to put the work in. You know, in almost every wedding I've performed as a pastor, I always want to emphasize with the couple what it's going to take to succeed in marriage, which is simply this, a selfless commitment to God and to each other. A selfless commitment to God and to each other. And I know and I believe that any marriage where both people are committed to loving and serving each other with God's sacrificial love can be everything they hope it will be on the wedding day. All right? Marriage is hard work, and making it thrive, not just survive, is even harder. But that day, that wedding day, that, that, that's, when, that's when all the hope, all the excitement, if you, if you go into your wedding day and, and you're not going in with the, the excitement and the anticipation of this is the rest of my, my, my future and the rest of my hope is right here, then that's a red flag that you, need to, you really need to analyze. But, you know, life can be difficult sometimes. We can't control our spouse, right? But we can control ourselves and what we bring to the relationship. And so just to kind of recap what we've been talking about, like what leads to healthy marriages, a lot of times, I said this when we talked about dating, that dating is actually where the real hard work is because that's when you figure out who this person are and whether or not they're even worth marrying. Because what did we learn a couple weeks ago? Marriage doesn't fix anything. Marriage magnifies. When you get married, all of a sudden, the whispers become shouts. And everything that, you know, if you, and, and stuff that you think, oh, we'll work it out after the wedding. That's not how it works. Okay? But marriages that last require us to have four things. Number one, it requires to have godly character. And I'm not saying, I, and, and when we look at these, we look at this at ourselves, not at the other person. So you know what you need? Some of you are married. Don't be looking at your spouse, okay? You hold up a mirror right now and you say, marriage requires me to have godly character. Who you are matters. That's why this whole series started with your identity in Christ. It also requires us to have Christ-like compassion. How you love matters, okay? Godly character and Christ-like compassion. And we know how to love because the Bible tells us how to love. We also need to have unwavering commitment. And that's the saying that you never, never, ever, ever, ever give up. And that matters. And, you know, I remember, I remember my parents getting into a fight. It was just a brutal fight. I think some dishes were broken, and I was a little kid, and I was crying. And I go up to my dad, and he's like, why are you crying? You know, because with dad, why are you crying? He says, dad, he was shaving in the bathroom. I remember distinctly, and I was like, I don't want your mom to get a divorce. He's like, we're not going to get a divorce. He kind of says to me in his in his. It's just my dad, just matter of fact kind of way. It's like divorce isn't even in my vocabulary. I'm like, okay, okay. And I believe my dad because he was trustworthy, but it was an unwavering commitment to work through the hard times, to celebrate the good times and work through the hard times. But that also means making selfless compromise. Selfless compromise is that what you sacrifice matters and both people need to be willing to give something up for the betterment of all. So I've been married over 20 years, 23 this year, coming up September. Woo! Coming up. I know, it's awesome. And my daughter just turned 18 this year. <laughs> oh, what just happened? And, uh, you know, we've been married 20 years, and it didn't just happen by accident. And the longer you're married isn't necessarily a guarantee. I have friends that have been married over 20 years, and they get divorced. I'm like, when did this fall apart? So I don't take it for granted. I don't take her for granted. It, it still takes work. We work daily to see our marriage succeed, and, and we work daily to overcome the challenges brought on by our own imperfections, right? As the Bible says, love does, in fact, cover a multitude of, of sins. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, the church teaches and believes that the marriage is supposed to be once, that what God has brought together, man should not separate. And the only thing that should break the legal bond of marriage is divorce, but whether we like it or not, we know divorce happens. We're going to talk about that today. And too many relationships uh, have been based simply on common interest or emotional attachment. Uh, marriages sometimes crumble when the needs of one person outweighs the willingness of the other person to, to give or when they no longer face the challenges and cares of the world as one where it's just, it's no longer we, but just me. You're doing your thing. They're doing their thing. Uh, there's many people in marriages who struggle because they don't feel like their needs are being met, even though, as we've learned, God calls us to worry about our spouse's needs uh, and not our own. Uh, many people end their marriages because they don't feel like they're in love anymore. And, you know, I recognize that, and I'm going to address this a little bit more, but we, we, I realize that every one of us in here at some point have been touched by divorce. Some of you have gone through divorce. 
Some of you have, have been hurt by, it's either from your parents or maybe you yourself has been divorced. And as we talk about this today, I really want it to be clear that I'm not condemning anybody. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about it. And my job is to prepare you for marriage. And if you're married, that's what can we do to make your marriage last. And if you've, uh, let me get through this whole thing, because I know some of you, maybe you, you've been affected by this and you have thoughts. Let's come back to it. Christ understood this idea of, of how marriages struggle, and, and he addressed the real reason at the heart and, and of the symptoms and excuses that people give. The Bible says, that uh, he left there where he was preaching and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And then here come the Pharisees, as they, as they do. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus asked them, well, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his, his, his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore, what man is joined together, let not, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So speaking directly from God's word, divorce was never God's design. It was never God's intent or desire, but it's been allowed, Jesus says, because of what? Because of the hardness of people's hearts. Well, what does that even mean? That's such a, you know, oh, your heart is hard. What, is that, what does that phrase mean? What does it mean to be hard of heart? And so I, I, I kind of came up with this definition, that even if God is convicting people of their selfishness and their foolishness, their stubborn hearts will not allow them to make the changes necessary to preserve and protect their marriage. Now, let me be careful here. Let me understand something. A lot of times, I don't hear what I'm saying. I don't hear, I'm not saying that if you have gone through a divorce that it's entirely your fault. We're going to see that there are other valid reasons, believe it or not, for divorce. But it's a matter of pride in a lot of ways, what kills a lot of marriages. And not the I accomplished nothing, something good kind. It's what God does is, like so many other things, because of men's stubbornness, he allows divorce to take place. And it's a concession but not within God's ideal purposes. And I, and I realize, like I said, many of you have been affected by divorce, either as children or personally experiencing it in your own marriage. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable to talk about, and deeply personal and emotional. Some of you, I will say right now, have been through divorce and you've come out of that, and it may be the health, healthiest thing because of where that relationship, because of the unhealthiness of the marriage relationship. And we're going to see some of this play out. I'm not advocating divorce, I'm simply saying see where we're going to go here. Um, what, I, what I try to do today is, is, is I want us to come away with a clear understanding of God's intentions for marriage and a grasp of how a divorce is addressed in Scripture. And I've written all of this down and talking about this as if my audience has not experienced divorce. What would I say to you if I just wanted you to protect your marriages? What would I want you to hear uh, so you can avoid it in your life? And, 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 I, and I get it. Some, some think, well, you're, you're ill-informed or... or, or, or your, your advice is impractical. Yeah, because I haven't gone through it, thankfully. But you'll, you'll see as we move forward that I hope to reveal a, a simplicity behind the complexities of divorce. Now, a couple of lawyers, you know, reported some of their weirdest divorce stories. Here's what they said. They said it took, it took the couple two hours to decide who would get the groceries left in the fridge. Estimated value of the groceries was around $40. Two hours of my time, opposing counsel time, and the mediator time added up to about $1,000. And it all came down to a Costco-sized jar of peanut butter. Uh, here's someone else says, our case fell apart over a massage chair. They had two, care, two kids, but they couldn't get over the chair. Uh, here's this one. We had a guy who cheated on his wife, transfer all of his money slowly over time to his girlfriend before the wife found out about their affair and filed for bankruptcy to avoid having to give his now ex-wife anything in the divorce. So during college, a friend of mine, we had to go. We were taking marriage and family studies as a class everyone had to take, and uh, we were sent to family court to observe the divorce proceedings, right? So we're sitting there observing the, 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 the attorneys discuss the terms of the impending divorce. Pretty sure they were arguing about the cat at one point. I was just, it was just weird listening to them talk about it. And after proceedings, you know, the judge says, well, why are you guys here? We said, oh, we're here for a college class, and we're doing this, and we have to. He said, well, what would you learn? Don't get married? He says, I said, no, man, just don't get divorced. 
can't afford it, you know, and, and I get it. There's some scary, scary statistics, you know, divorce in America, brr, uh, you know, 50, the, the most common statistic out there is that, is that 50% of marriages end in divorce. And look, there are certainly a lot of divorces in America, and, and too many for sure. We do have a higher divorce rate than a lot of countries. But the numbers, I want to give you some truth here. The numbers are a little misleading. So this 40 to 50% number that most people cite, it's not an actual objective number, but it's, it's what they call an educated, an educated projection. Uh, one, one author says, the University of Denver's Scott Stanley uh, says, uh, how this number is derived is, quote, crazy complicated. He says this 40 to 50% number comes from a detailed analysis of various population demographics, including ages, lifespan projections, and represents a sophisticated projection of a calculated risk, much like projecting the lifespan for babies born today. It's a valid protection under, uh, projection under current conditions, and it pertains to new first-time marriages. So what does that even mean? Well, in short, it comes down uh, from looking at divorce trends of the last few decades and applying these numbers to couples marrying today. In other words, well, because a bunch of people got divorced at one time, we think this is where that's going to go. Well, the previous generation that leads this, this, this divorce statistic is the baby boomers who were very divorce prone, okay? Uh, and, and, and because a lot of them saw divorce being modeled by their parents because who were their parents? Well, their parents were parents who got married prior to or just after World War II. And they made a lot of very hasty marriage decisions. Like, are we gonna get married? Then I'm gonna go off to, then I'm gonna go off to the Pacific. And you come back and realize, uh, didn't really, they, they got married because they thought they were going to get killed, all right? So what happened was is they got divorced. It led to a lot of divorces of these people, these tw- you know, 20-something-year-old people coming back from war going, this isn't what I want for my, the rest of my life. Uh, and so then that behavior was emulated in their children. So here's another statistic po- uh, that, that, that says that this, that currently 22% of women, 21% of men have, have ever been divorced. Now, some of, some of these have remarried, and what uh, the statistics are is that about 11% of women and 9% of men are currently divorced. That is, they've not remarried. So it's, that's not 50%, okay? That's not actually 50%. Look, are there a lot of marriages in trouble? You bet. Uh, but in one sense, it is getting better. The fact is no one enters marriage hoping or planning for it to fall apart. It's just like you don't have kids hoping that you'll send them to therapy someday, right? You... you you don't get married going, and if you get married thinking that, oh, it could all fall apart, then why are you getting married in the first place? Now, as, as marriages falter and fail, it, it should give us pause to consider what? Being more careful when we enter into matrimony in the first place, and, and building a marriage is like remodeling a house. Right? Do it right the first time, otherwise it will cost you more to fix it and do it again. But what, what do I want you to understand? It's this. Divorce is not inevitable. Divorce is not inevitable. Now, speaking on divorce, Jesus said, I say to you, listen to this. This is key. You're going to hear this verse a couple times. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Wow, man, what a terrible attitude. What an absolutely garbage attitude to have about marriage. Oh, if it's going to be hard and you can't just walk away from this, why would you even get married? I know people like that. Oh, we decided to move in together. We bought a house together, but we're not getting married. Why? So you can have a giant back door? Because that's really what it is. You can just break up, right? Who just broke up? Who gets the count? I don't know. It's easy to say many marriages fall apart, so why even try? And many people do say that. But if, if marriage is a joy and each person is selflessly serving the other, it's a beautiful thing to see. And our relationships do not have to be a negative statistic. Real quick, I'm going to show you two things that hurt marriages and four things that help. Okay, These are things that have statistically shown to affect and, and touch the likelihood of divorce. I'm going to go through the, here are the two things that hurt. Cohabitation and your sexual history. Cohabitating couples have a 40 to 80% higher likelihood of divorce than non-cohabitating couples. People that move in to try it out it usually blows up in their face. When I was growing up, we lived in this, this, this uh, it's like a triplex. There's like three, one big building, but three units. And the one on the end was this one little studio. And I, I can't tell you, I, I used to think that place was cursed because people, couples would move in 
and inevitably one of them would move out. You know, I was like, what happens to all these couples? Something I, I thought was the building. Now I'm realizing these statistics here. But also sexual history. Marrying as non-virgins uh, is associated with a, quote, considerably higher risk of divorce and dramatically more unstable first marriages. Now, is that a death sentence for a marriage? No, but these are statistically what they show. Uh, here's another one, though, that helped. Your age, over 18, 24% less risk of uh, getting divorced. If you get over 18, you think, well, who gets married younger than 18? People get married younger. It's, I, think, I think there's some states where 16 is the legal age. When, from 18 to about 22, 23, I've seen people get married, and it's amazing how much you change over that period of time, um, and you mature into adulthood. So, yeah, yeah, just that four years, right? It's incredible. But, it, you know, so all of you who are waiting, by choice or by not, not a bad thing. Education, right? Education, 27, only 27% of college graduates will divorce by middle age. So as I said, stay in, stay in cool, kids. Um, but these ones are key. Beliefs, listen to this. Going into marriage with husband and wife holding a strong personal conviction that marriage is for life protects against divorce. Huge. And then religion, those with a strong common faith have a 7 to 14% lower risk of divorce. However, having a nominal faith has no protective effect. Okay, just saying you're a Christian is not the same as actually practicing faith. And we've been building up to this discussion because on making marriage last because if people exercise the wisdom, the humility, the patience that we talked about in healthy dating, demonstrating the characteristics that overflow from a right relationship with God and an identity rooted in Jesus, we are all more likely to avoid entering into harmful or caustic marriages. And I recognize that, look, sometimes, I get this, let me say this, sometimes the ugly only comes out after the rings are on. Okay, and a lot of people that get married, they seem like a nice person, but something happened, they put that ring on, it all fell apart. People cite all kinds of reasons for divorce, you know, irreconcilable differences, lack of communication, money problems is huge. Uh, I don't love him or her anymore. Health issues, and all these are symptoms of larger issues, and all of these are circumstances that can be overcome by surrendering to God's leading and purposes in our own lives. Learning how to communicate, handling money, uh, adjusting to health issues are all things that we can, what? We can learn if a person is willing to do the work. And someone who's not willing to do the work, who, uh, who refuses to grow, what? They choke the potential from their own marriage. And a person who lives with somebody who refuses to grow, because what? Marriage takes two people. Someone who lives with someone who refuses to grow can only handle so much before they're either crushed by the weight of their spouse's indifference, or they just break out altogether. Now, my understanding, the Bible, the only true biblical reasons for divorce, and, and the Bible gives them, are adultery and abuse, whether it's physical or emotional. And I know that some of you have come out of adulterous or abusive relationships. Um, adultery, in adultery, look, adultery can take many forms, not just sexual, emotional, mental adultery violates the marriage covenant as well. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus clarified God's view on divorce. He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And later we saw that verse. Uh, whoever divorces his wife, let, her give, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So well, we're going to come back and talk about that, about where sexual immorality plays in. But God's greatest desire, truly, I believe, in relationships, as much as possible, is reconciliation. But again, it takes both people putting the work in. I, I've seen it firsthand where, a couple on, where couples on the brink of divorce reconcile because both have sought the Lord's direction. They both get right with Jesus, and, and they, they put the work in. I've seen a couple who are divorced for over 20 years reconcile and remarry. Again, due to what? The Lord's intervention and grace and somebody getting their relationship, one of them getting their relationship with God right. I will always pray for reconciliation first, believing it to be the, the outcome of real humility and forgiveness. But let me say this, a relationship where physical or emotional abuse is happening or where one or both people is violating the marriage covenant through sexual immorality, that marriage, that marriage ended long before the legal contract was dissolved. Uh, in some cases, it's better or safer, 
for the couple to separate. And, 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 and if it means protecting a spouse from harm, or more importantly, protecting kids from harm, God's concessions to the hardness of people's hearts may be the best course of action. But well, people ask me, well, doesn't the Bible give permission for divorce? Well, look, Jesus said this, you know, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, right? He's referencing an Old Testament law. Here's what Deuteronomy says. When a man takes a wife and he marries her, if she finds no favor in her, his eyes because she has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, right? And then the later man hates her. Guys are brutal back then. Hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for inheritance. So what's the story? So she's married, the guy divorces her, she goes and marries somebody else, that guy ditches her or dies, and she can't go back to the first guy. That's what the law is saying. And there was this common belief that men could simply divorce their wife with little or no real grounds, and he could determine he was displeased with her and send her away. And there's still some cultures that practice this. The certificate, though, was look, was look, was designed to show that she had been released from her marriage and was free to marry another. The problem, though, is that Deuteronomy was being viewed as being what permissive of divorce. So yeah, just, just divorce your wife, give her a certificate. But what it meant to do was prevent adultery from happening, which would have been the result of the scenario described in the passage. But sometimes, right? Divorce. And we know, we all know people have been divorced. And sometimes in our culture, we celebrate divorce. Oh, we're so glad you guys finally split up. You know, there's always reasons, right? Sometimes it's justified. What about abuse and adultery and, you know, irreconcilable differences? Well, you remember what Jesus said? Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. I had, the, I had the privilege of interviewing a guy who, who was divorced, and I asked him point blank, so what led you to your divorce? Just, just what was it? He, first of all, he, 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 he took blame for it, and he said this, selfishness and disobedience. Selfishness and disobedience, he said. Uh, and he told me, he said, it was on my part. He said, here's the reality. For marriages to really work, it takes two people who are invested, who are engaged, who selflessly minister to the other person. Each of us has a role to play for the benefit of the other, and when one or both begin to focus on themselves or begin to stray from the responsibility of their role, the marriage suffers, which is where selfishness and disobedience come into play. Think about it. What reasons for divorce don't fall under those two categories of selfishness and disobedience? Disobedience to God, disobedience to our roles, selfishness. And that's where hardness of heart manifests, right? We begin to harden our heart to the needs of the other person, seeking only for ourselves, reconciliation then becomes impossible because someone's not willing to put the work in. And divorce was permitted, what, as a grace. It certainly wasn't promoted. As Jesus said, from the beginning it was not so. Right? From the beginning it was not so. Marriage was always intended to be a lifelong commitment of ministry and grace to each other. But it seems to be an exception in the Bible. So why... Is sexual immorality an acceptable reason? Now, I do know marriages that have survived sexual immorality, but it's probably killed more marriages than anything. And the Bible says, you know, if anyone divorces, you know, gives all these caveats, but says, but sexual immorality, even this seems to be the, the, the line. Now, we're going to talk about adultery itself in greater detail in a couple of weeks, but consider this. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament adultery was, was uh, punishable by death, Right? Leviticus 20.10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Take him out to the city gates and stone him. Be done with it. So based on that, one would certainly be free to remarry because guess what? Their, their spouse was dead. The adulterer was dead. Problem solved, right? <laughs> Here's your receipt. Here's your receipt, yeah. So based on, uh, but, but allowing divorce, listen to this, allowing divorce versus executing the offender 
was in fact a grace to the offender. Through adultery, however, the marriage was, is violated and diluted. One has joined themselves to another. A sacred bond was broken, and that betrayal is difficult to overcome. So allowing divorce was a mercy. You consider, you consider Joseph, he wanted to put Mary away quietly because of the perceived indiscretion of her pregnancy, but uh, per the law, he could have had her stoned for, you know, if that angel hadn't stepped in. Before the angel stepped in, he's just like, I'm just going to put you away quietly. And say, no, 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 this is from, this is from God. But he would have been within his rights, within the law. In fact, when Jesus was given the opportunity to condemn a person found in adultery, what? He offered grace. That story's in John chapter 8. But Jesus also said this, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, here's this verse again, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So this is where it gets sticky, and this is where I want to talk about this, because people read this and go, well, I'm divorced. Does this mean that I'm committing adultery because I've got remarried, or I can never marry again? Does that mean my next relationship is an adulterous relationship? Let's, let me help you with this as best I can. It gets sticky because we see a lot of divorce and remarriage within the church. I've known pastors who have gone in the ministry after being divorced and, and married again. So does this mean that any who divorce for any other reasons will actually be committing adultery? Okay, well, the first answer is yes. That's what it says, right? And this, is so, and this is so we have a greater understanding that marriage is more than just a legal transaction. And I've been trying to make that clear over the last few weeks. It's a union of what? Body, soul, and spirit. You'll forever be bound to that person. And, and I know people who have been divorced and based on this passage itself will not remarry. But the second answer is yes, but. Yes, but. I'm not amending scripture, but listen to this. When we understand the grace of God, we have to understand what? That he allows divorce. That while this isn't his ideal, there is grace and forgiveness. And I don't know that I could personally make that decision about getting remarried, but I also don't have divorce in my vocabulary, so I'm praying it's never an option. John MacArthur says this. He says, if God permitted divorce, listen to this, if God permitted divorce rather than death as a merciful concession to man's sinfulness, why would he not also allow remarriage since remarriage would be perfectly allowable under the original law of death for the adulterer, right? After all, he says, the purpose of divorce was to show mercy to the guilty party, in this case the adulterer, not to sentence the innocent party to a life of loneliness and misery, okay? So that's where this grace of divorce comes in, in these, in these roles of sexual morality. Well, so what? hope that clarifies it a little bit. Divorce is never God's plan. It never was. Pharisees came up to Jesus, Matthew 19, and they say, and they tested him, of course, by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus answered, have you not heard, have you not read what, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay? Consider these words real quick. What God has joined together. One author gives this perspective. He says this. Everything about our dating relationships. Listen to this. It's cool. Everything about our, uh, about our dating relationships and our engagements and our weddings. And oh yeah, even our marriages are self-chosen. Right? Even though marriages in Jesus' day were arranged, uh, pun intended, far differently, the principle was the same. People were making logical, relational, sometimes political decisions. And then Jesus refers to the whole thing as what God has joined together. Think about this. You think about all the reasons that you get married, and yet we stand there in front of God, and he says what God has brought together. According to Jesus, he says, marriages that appear to be the culmination of various decisions, at least for Christians, take on a whole new mysterious nature. God takes two people, joins them into one, in a way that God says humans don't have the authority to separate. Marriage is greater than the sum of its parts. And some people think that Jesus was just simply commenting on, on the Jewish law, but his words remind us that God ordained the family before he handed down the law of Moses and that the family is designed to be sacred and irrevocable. Let me give you this concluding statement. Marriage is last when we put God and our spouse first. How do we make marriage last? By putting God and our spouse first. You can... Divorce proof your marriage. This is your first marriage, your second marriage, the marriage that you're in right now. I'm telling you, 
You can divorce proof your marriage. And if you're hoping to get married someday, you can divorce proof your marriage if we follow God's plan for marriage and we commit to being obedient to our roles of selfishness and service. Our marriages will stand the test of time. And if we have been through divorce, hear me, we can find grace in God that allows us to move forward. And finally, if you find yourself in a marriage going south, by God's strength and grace, there can be restoration and healing. My heart for you someday is to be in a marriage that lasts till death do you part. I pray that for you. And I understand marriages can be tough. I understand that it only takes one person to, to quit trying. But that's why we surrender daily to God and give it up to God and pray for his strength. I don't believe that any marriage is guaranteed, even mine, but I keep working at it because it's worth it, because my spouse is worth it, because being obedient to God is worth it. Marriages aren't perfect because people aren't perfect. I will be the first one to say that. But I do serve a perfect God who wants the best for us, and if we follow his plan, we can make it. Father, give us an opportunity to really rest on these things and ruminate on these things.